Ay po. Can we have one uh, balolong, please? Balolong to, no? Balolong. Balolong, no? Balolong. 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 Food and connection are two of the most important things we need, and it's the best way to learn about someone in a short amount of time. Leia and I will try out some of the local favorites in Quiapo, Divisoria, then end the day in Malabon, all while getting to know each other. This is the first time we've met, and I believe conversations are always best when our mouths are full. Perfect. He just he saw us, he's like, alright, let's start. <laughs> For today's episode, we're going on a food trip with Top Chef alumni Leah Cohen. She's a half Filipino, half American with Romanian Jewish roots, chef, author, and owner of New York restaurants Pig and Cow and Piggyback, which both serve Southeast Asian cuisine influenced by her travels with some dishes expressing her Filipino roots. To start, I wanted to show Leah a side of Filipino cuisine that she might not be familiar with yet. So I brought her to the Quiapo Muslim town for some authentic Mindanao food. All right, so this is the Golden Mosque area. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's a good area because this is where the mosque is, so a lot of the food that's here is very traditional. Actually, one of the first things, this is probably something you haven't seen before. Here. This is called sakurab. Hi, Paul. So sakurab is uh, a scallion. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's only grown around a lake in Mindanao, which is called Lake Lanao. Um, so they use it, this is kind of like foundation in their cooking. Mm -hmm. But this is made into a dish that we'll try later, which is called palapa, uh, and a lot of dishes. So, so how does this taste different than like a scallion? It's, pu it's punchier. Okay. Way punchier, um, way sharper, um, which is why it's, like you, you won't find a lot of pastes cooking in the Philippines when yeah. you start with a paste, right? Whereas when you go to Indonesia or Thailand, yeah. you have a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so that's why this style of cooking and this kind of like area and culture is very interesting to me. And it's impossible to find. This is the only place you'll find it in Manila, which is crazy. For our first stop, I took Leah to Jun Naira Halal Food Restaurant. We've featured them at least two times already, and we will keep coming back for their Maranao dishes. I'm sure a lot of this feels very foreign. Like, do you recognize no, uh, except for maybe the bunsen <laughs> and the empalaya. Yeah. But everything else is no. fairly, yeah. right? But so, it looks like food I've had in other countries. Correct. Yes. What's your favorite? Do you have one? I love chicken piaparan. Uh, so this is mostly what you call Maranao cuisine. So Maranao is uh, an area that's around Lake Lanao, which is northwest Mindanao. Um, and they have very kind of like intertwined flavors. Um, it's getting more and more blurred. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's tough to kind of go around, but the chicken kebab is probably my favorite. Okay. But even you'll just try the spice palapa and you're yeah. gonna be like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. So this is kind of like a, an overwhelming selection. <laughs> so usually when you do these, at the end of the day, right, it's just always a lot of food, but I think it's a, yeah. it's a great kind of introduction into Maranao food. So as I was saying a while ago, Northwestern Mindanao, um, a lot of spice in their food, which is not very common in Filipino food, right? Yeah. I don't know uh, about you, but when I think of coconut, I usually think of like Nicolano, mm -hmm. Nicolano food, yeah. right? But it's very, you'll see it in almost all the dishes. So I actually want you to try the palapa first. Okay. Um, is any of it like really spicy? Are you, how's your spice level? Excellent. Okay, so you'll be fine. <laughs> try it with you. My spice level is pretty terrible. Mm. So that main flavor you're getting there is the palapa. That's really that good. very punchy, yeah. kind of like almost funky uh, flavor. A lot of that comes from the palapa and then obviously uh, pounded chilies with some ginger. Um, and then you'll see that it's kind of speckled all throughout. And so that's kind of like the base of the cooking of Marinao cuisine. That's really good. And not not what you would consider I Filipino. Would not, no, I would eat that and then I would say that's more like Indonesian, Malay. Correct. Definitely not Filipino. The two dishes here, this is what they call piaparan. Yeah. So just like how you would have adobo. <coughs> See, this is where I'm struggling. <laughs> <laughs> just like it, it has some kick. It has a good sure, kick to it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, just like how you do a adobo, it's kind of like adobo can be used for multiple proteins. Yeah. Piaparan is the same thing. Um, so it's usually cooked with the palapa. And then here, 
This is a fish that they call arau, um, which is kind of like the head of that fish. This is what they call balbacoa, so very different from a balbacoa that you'll find in like Davao, uh, which is kind of closer to like a more soupy, clearer uh, broth. Then we have beef rendang. Then we have the piaparan, so same, but this time with beef liver. Okay. Um, and this is their local version of an adobo using oh. duck. Duck? Yeah. So very different adobo. You'll see that they add kind of like some caramelized garlic on top of it, some chilies. Yeah. So flavor profile-wise, very different from what you're yeah. used to. Do they use a lot of duck here? Um, it's seen as an alternative protein. And so what's in that? Adobo. Um, this one, so the guy didn't want to tell me, <laughs> so we're gonna figure that out Super together. Secret. <laughs> but I feel, I feel like it's a sweeter adobo. Okay. Yeah. So obviously all of this eaten with rice. Yes. Um, when we do food tours, we try not to eat too much of it, so that we have space for everything else. You can add the palapa as an extra condiment. Okay. As you eat it. Oh, really good. And what's this? That's just a soup. So. In most Filipino tables, curry areas, you're always going to find a soup element to it. Okay. I got to tell you, this is unlike any other Filipino food that I've eaten. Right? Yeah. The first time I came to the Philippines, I was four years old. Okay. Like, almost like the age of my oldest son. Yeah. Um, my dad was obsessed with the Philippines. Like, he... <laughs> sometimes you think he's more Filipino than my mom. <laughs> like, just came here in the 70s, went to dental school and became, fell in love with the country and just really wanted to embrace and teach us um, as much as we could. Yeah. And um, so he made it a point for us to come all the time when we were young. I don't know if my mom wanted to come that often, but he wanted to always come. And so I came here at four years old and then every two years we would come during Christmas and okay. New Year's because we would have break from school. Which is crazy because it's obviously it's like a crazy time to yeah. come. It's yeah, so yeah, busy, um, and then we would go to a lot of like Filipino house parties mm -hmm. at, in the states in New York. Um, is your mom also? Uh, does she cook a lot? Oh, she's at home? terrible. Oh, is she? she's terrible. She's such a bad cook. <laughs> and everyone asked me that. They're like, "So, did you learn how to cook Filipino food from your mom?" I'm like, yeah, nope. "No, absolutely <laughs> not." I'm like, "She's a dentist. She can cook like four things. Um, she's not really a good cook." No. So, how did you get into cooking? My grandma. Ah, cool, okay. On my father's side. Okay. Um, I only had one grandparent growing up, and she was a home ec teacher. Okay. And so back then, they taught a lot of cooking yeah. in school. And so um, we lived with her for like the first five years of my life, and so I was just with her in the kitchen nice. all okay. the time. And then, yeah, and then I just, it's the only thing I'm good at. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so this is, I think it's a great start. I mean, when you think about Filipino food, it's very hard to define it. But there's such a huge variety of it. And a lot of time, honestly, like we're still discovering things all the time. But a lot of Filipinos don't know about this spot. No. No. It's still very much seen as a kind of like a, um, a culture that not a lot of people interact with on a daily basis. Yeah. But if you do go to Mindanao, you will interact with this. You will see it quite a lot. And it's funny how something has, that's seen as common there, here can be so foreign to yeah. a lot of people. This is all so good. So in your restaurants, your first one was pig and cow, yes. right? Uh -huh. um, what kind of food did you start cooking there? And then how did it kind of, that kind of start evolving and changing? So pig and cow, Southeast Asian food. Mm -hmm. um, so basically after Top Chef, right? Yeah. I kind of, it was weird because the fans are crazy. Of Top Chef? Of Top Chef. Really? Crazy, fanatics. Yeah. And I would like walk down the street and people would be like, oh my God. And it was like the weirdest thing to me because I'm like, I don't know why you want a picture with me and why you're talking with me. It was really, it was just a really strange feeling. Yeah. And um, and then the press was like all over me. Really? And not in a good way. Okay. Like they kind of like shit on me. Um, and so I was like, you know what, I just want to get away and go somewhere, focus on the food that I want to cook. So I moved to Southeast Asia, and I, packed, I basically packed a suitcase and I staged all over Southeast oh, that Asia. That was right after Top Chef? Yeah, oh, okay. it was like six months after, okay. too, yeah. And so I did that, and then my goal was always to do Thai food. I just love the flavors and the food of, like, of Thai cuisine. And then, I, you know, if your visa runs up, you have to go somewhere else, and right. do a visa run, come back. So I was like, you know, why am I going to go to Malaysia for three days when I stay right there for 30 days? Yeah. I had no real plan. And then my mom was like, 
well, what are you going to do when you go back? I was like, I want to open a restaurant. She said, well, you can't do Southeast Asian food and not do Filipino food. And I was like, you're right. <laughs> I got to like pay respect to where I come from. So um, I came here, I saw in some restaurants here, and then uh, I opened Pig and Cow like a year later after okay. I got back. But I wanted it, I like the fact that I had an idea in my head of doing Thai, but then because of my travels, I wanted, I fell in love with all the food. Yeah. And there was no restaurant at that time in New York where you could get kind of everything under one roof. It was very either Thai restaurant, Filipino restaurant, Malaysian restaurant, without it being a fusion restaurant because the dishes were very true to the cuisine. Yeah. They, I didn't mix like Vietnamese and Thai make a dish together. Correct. I really wanted it to be authentic, but something that you could get. And I wanted it for a place where people felt like they were traveling around Southeast Asia. Okay, cool. Pair that with the Lower East Side of New York, which is very like urban, rough around the edges, mm -hmm. old school hip hop, kind of, that's how Pig and Cow kind of became what it is, nice. and I still want to keep it very Southeast Asian. Have yeah. you found yourself kind of cooking more Filipino food as you've kind of gotten older? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I thought Filipino food was weird. I mean, yeah. if I'm being honest, you know, like I didn't, no one else was eating that kind of food yeah. around me. So when my mom would like make me lunch, it was different than everyone else was mm. having. So eventually they just made me American lunch, <laughs> and I was okay with it. Um, and of course I love like, you know, like, lumpia and stuff like that but it wasn't until I got much older where I really started to appreciate the food mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't that big into like I want I thought I, I was gonna cook like Italian food for forever you okay. know I yeah. studied it I lived in Italy and I cooked in, in Italy and I thought that's what I was gonna do mm -hmm. but I just never felt connected to it and I never felt I truly understand the flavors and I feel like the flavors of kind of all the countries in Southeast Asia make sense to me yeah. um, and they just I, I can and you I can, can marry them like yeah. on a menu it's not weird to it's see weird. different dishes from different places I think we all use ingredient common ingredients just Correct. in different ways and so the crossover is really nice mm -hmm. and um, it makes it more interesting I think than just having like all Thai food yeah, um, yeah definitely people are getting more interested in our own food yeah and that's why I always think there's really no right or wrong way to kind of approach it because there is no Escoffier, there's no guidebook, there's no culinary school that has mother sauces and stuff yeah. like that. So it comes down to experience, meeting people, coming to places like this, where maybe the people who make it here don't, they don't necessarily feel like they're doing anything special, but they're a huge integral part to the community. Yeah. Um, and just kind of seeking them out and trying out the, the food that comes out of here, because then that, that opens up really the versatility of the cuisine, right? Yeah. So we'll, we'll check out some, some kakanin, some local kakanin that they have here. Ano to? Okay. Can we have one also? Since you said you never tried a carb on carb, here you go. <laughs> so just white bread yeah. with sticky rice. Yeah. What so is this, this is pretty cool. Um, it's a crepe, so again, you don't really see crepes much mm -hmm. in local cuisine, and it's stuffed with like a sweet coconut, like a bukayo, yeah, like a dried sweet coconut. That's good. Very subtle. Mm. A lot of people say the, the best Asian comment you can get about dessert is, "Oh, it's not too sweet." <laughs> it's a very Filipino or this mom thing to say. Hey, though. Ah, come on, tinka hon. So this is sweet potato and corn. Cassava, sorry, cassava, yeah. That's not sweet at all. Yeah. Nice too, right? Yeah. Like a nice little yep. subtlety to it. Um, these are their local pancakes. What do you, what do you, what do you name them? Apang kuya. Apang. You see it's rice, mm -hmm. but it's fairly, like if you touch it, fairly fluffy. So they, oh, yeah. a lot of times what they do is they let it kind of like sit for a while. So that natural fermentation, fermentation starts happening, but yeah. it's like, just a couple hours under the sun is more than enough. Mm -hmm. And it gets nice and, and fluffy. Cool. Just a short walk away from the Kiapo Muslim town is the Globe Lumpia House, which has been a crowd favorite since 1956. They are renovating their restaurant, so for now it's street side takeout only, but the line was still really impressive. So this is oh, a cool. tiny, tiny store. Okay. They literally only do the lumpia. 
And do they, is it fresh or fresh? Fresh, fresh and yeah. And they only sell one thing. That's it. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I think that's so cool because you know they've like really honed Perfected in on their it. craft. We'll eat it outside, yeah. Is that cool? Okay, so very loud, very chaotic, but that's the best way. Uh, you were saying a while ago, you've tried this already, actually yesterday. Yes. And how big was it compared to this one? This was like, the one yesterday was like three times the size. It was the equivalent of like a burrito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This was... That's the right, right size. Mm. It's a little sweet. I love the garlic. The garlic? Uh-huh. So you rarely see that where the garlic sauce is separated. Yeah. Usually, usually it's added. mixed into the peanut sauce. Yeah. yeah. Usually it's peanut sauce or the, the soy cornstarch yeah. sauce, right? It goes there. This is really good. Really nice, yeah. Uh-huh. And I think having it straight off the line as it comes out makes a huge difference. Yeah. Because these wouldn't survive too long. Yeah, right? for sure. They would get soggy. So you, you asked me a while ago, are you team fried or fresh usually? I mean, if I'm being honest, I'm a fried lumpia girl all yeah. the way. Yeah. I love anything fried, but this is so good. And I don't feel guilty yeah. eating it. Yeah, it feels very light. I think a lot of this food, so lumpia, whether fresh or fried. Yeah. It, so we started off with Maranao food, Muslim in the now. Here you're now moving into Manila, and kind of like the early, I don't know what, trading routes open with China. So lots of kind of like Filipino Chinese food. So a lot of this comes from that, right? Yeah. Um, so it just shows you how different this is from what we just had. It right? doesn't even seem like it's the same cuisine. Yeah, the same yeah. country at all, right? No. Which is crazy. <laughs> and then they sent out some empanadas, which are piping hot. I'm guessing vegetable. Ooh. Oh no, wrong. So chicken, ground chicken, potatoes, and sayote, I'm guessing. Either ground chicken or ground pork. How is it? Mm. I like that they're hot. Very hot. <laughs> Good. Crazy. The crust is very nice. Yep. So usually empanadas in the Philippines tend to be very sweet. Yeah. So you'll have pork. Uh, lots of potatoes, usually lots of extenders, not, not a lot of meat. Um, raisins sometimes as well. Oh, really? Yeah, so it, it ends up being very sweet, but this is actually really well balanced. And you'll find a lot of times when potatoes were expensive, people used um, sayote. Uh, Either sayote or green papaya okay. in, in their mixes as well. Okay, okay. next stop. From Quiapo, we headed next to Divisoria, where I brought Leah to the Six Ladies Carinderia, which went viral for their palabok negra, or palabok with squid ink. So this is uh, why we decided to make this kind of part of the, the eating tour. Is I feel like it's a side of Manila that when people here, or maybe not from here, don't necessarily get to experience much. Yeah. Um, I could have definitely, we could have went to like really great you know, eateries and more modern restaurants and things like that, but I feel like that's something that you would have probably tried on your own time yeah. at one point. But these little places are popping up. They've always been very kind of strong in terms of uh, a strong following from the people that work around here, that work in the market. But more recently, because of social media, digital media, everyone starts flocking to this, these little places, yeah. right? Um, so they got really popular because of their squid ink okay. uh, palabok. Most of the flavor comes from the sauce as well as the tinapa that's there. That's the powder that you see. Love that. And then fried, uh, a mix of chicharron, but also there's some fried offal in there. And then they over here they served us some um, futo? Yeah, it's like, yeah. like a, rice, a rice, uh, steamed rice cake. Is that traditionally like a pairing? So, like you said, carb on carb, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so sometimes with pancit, it's, it can be a puto, but it can also be. Um, pan de sal, uh, okay. people eat it with it. So this is like, I know you just did a whole thing on calamansi. This is one thing we cannot get really? in New York. Like the ones that we get are super dry okay. and it's crazy expensive. Are they orangey or still the green ones? Um, they're still the green ones, Okay. but they're very dry and they're very expensive. And for 
how much money you're going to spend on so little amount of juice, juice it's not even this, worth this it. Makes sense, yeah. On the East Coast, you can definitely get it, and okay. it's much better. If it's supported more, it is something that could be sold internationally quite easily. Yeah. Vietnam is growing way more clemencies than us now, and yeah. it's starting to do more than that. So a lot of what we do is just focus on how do we, how can we help local agriculture kind of flourish. Really good. I didn't try this. Okay, let's try that one. Yeah. My goal is to find someone in Florida to grow calamansi. Yeah, it would totally grow there. It would 100% yeah. grow there. There's a lot of businesses now that do like exotic fruits there, right? Yeah. yeah. Key lime is huge there, so why can't calamansi be? Correct. So you'll see the squid is not like crazy overpowering. Yeah. It's not fishy. The only kind of like fishy flavor you get is from the tinapa, the dried fish. Sorry, smoke, smoke fish. <laughs> There's really no strict rules to it, right? Um, is that something, because you've, you've been posting a lot more Filipino recipes. Yeah. How's that been? Um, it was scary at first because if you look at me, you would have no idea that I'm sure. half Filipino. And I don't speak Tagalog. And yeah, there's just a lot of things not in my favor. Correct. So for some people um, to say, why is she you know, trying to teach us how to make Filipino food? So I was really intimidated about that, but once I kind of gave zero shits about it yeah. um, and just was like, this is what I want to do, it's actually been really nice and refreshing. Um, of course I get the haters in the comments, course, like, yeah. you know, my biggest thing was I put coconut milk in my adobo yeah. and I mean, it was like the most controversial <laughs> thing ever because people are like, you don't put coconut milk in adobo. Yeah. Which you can. Which you can. Which it's, you absolutely it is, can. And it's one of them, right? Yeah. And I love it because it, I think it adds, it kind of balances out all the sharpness from the vinegar and it right. makes everything creamy and just kind of makes everything better. But yeah, that was like, it was really intimidating at first um, just because I didn't know how like the Filipino community would embrace respond me to it. and yeah. respond to it. And it's been really positive for the okay. most part, which is nice. But as someone who, you know, you're half, yeah. you know how... You know how the it feeling. is, yeah. <laughs> did you did you ever feel the pressure of kind of like uh, maybe kind of bringing the food to a wider audience? Is that one of the reasons why? I mean, obviously you cook Filipino food because it's part of who you are. Yeah. But do you feel some sort of responsibility in terms of you know it'd be nice to see more people eating eating yeah. our food, right? I mean, especially in the United States and in New York. New York has a really big Filipino population in Queens, right? Um, but outside of Queens. It's not that big. And so you can find all of the Filipino restaurants in Queens and it's cheap, it's considered cheap food. Yeah. And you know, back back when I opened Pig and Cow like 10 years ago, there was a handful of people doing more, I don't want to say elevated, but more um, just different Filipino Like a food, different approach. A yeah. different approach. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I felt like it was an obligation to, to myself to, to do that and to bring that to light. Um, yeah. And it also really connected me to my Filipino culture. I feel like as much as I'm trying to educate people, I'm also educating myself more and I feel more connected to my mother's side, yeah. um, which is really important because now I have kids and I want them to feel connected as well. I think that people, if you're proud of where you come from and you want to know more, I think it's really important just to kind of spread the word. For me, what's interesting is because um, Pancit uh, Palabok seems like a very, it could be filled chai, almost like Filipino Chinese in yeah. terms of how it's presented and its roots and everything. But the key thing for me here is the um, anato or achuete sauce, which Achuete seeds would not have been here without the Spanish influence yeah. and without the galleon trade between Mexico and the Philippines and that's the only way we got that ingredient here, right? Um, so it's funny how kind of like a cuisine evolves. Yes. So here you have a, a plate of seemingly Chinese noodles topped with a Mexican sauce, <laughs> some chicharron, yeah. some smoked fish. It really comes together beautifully in a plate of food, right? Yeah, absolutely. This Malobon, it's still part of Metro Manila, uh -huh. um, much closer to the sea. But this is where your original Pancit Malobon is from. They have a lot of kakanin, uh, rice cakes, and everything from this area. But their crispy pata is very, very famous. Finally, for our last stop, we went to Malabon, where we tried an heirloom crispy pata recipe at the 51-year-old Jamico's restaurant.
So your father was the one who started yes, doing yes. this, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's his own recipe. Ah, uh, okay. So, but now, now they just go straight from here. Yes. In the, into the second fry, yeah. Yeah, because or else people don't want to wait 20, yes, 25 minutes, that's right? Our, that's our main problem. Yeah. This is like insane. It's a very, very nice looking crispy pasta. I say we go for this first, so yeah. get it fresh. I'm just gonna go with my hands. Yeah, do it. I'm just gonna try it plain first. So you said this one's a little bit sweeter, right? Sweeter. Okay. Get that. Really good. Which makes it very different from, I mean, I don't think a lot of people would boil their pork in some sort of sugar brine, but it works. Pressing the meat. So tender. It's like you said, right? If you're doing the same thing over and over again for yeah. 50 years now here, at one point, hopefully you get it right. And a crispy pata at a high volume is not an easy thing to do, right? The, just the temperature, the sequencing, I pro you probably know more than me, but it'd be really yeah. difficult to get it right. What's something when you're in the US you kind of really miss and crave for when it comes to Filipino food? That we can't get there. The bananas that we get in the States are just starch, right? Yeah. They taste like nothing. And something as simple as like turon or even just like the banana queue. Mm. I love bananas and you just can't get anything like that. Nothing can replicate like the, the real lumpia wrapper, the real banana. Correct. And it's just probably something because that's what I grew up eating and it's like very nostalgic for me, but it's something so simple but you that you think you could get, but you can't. Um, and it's also, yeah, recipes can be recreated, but produce cannot. Even if you were to get that imported, it would still spend some time on a boat and it would kind of change over time, right? So that, that makes a lot of sense. So. You want to try the tortang yeah. lima sog? I've never had this. So the most, I mean, the most famous tortang you're gonna have is eggplant, eggplant yeah. right? Um, but yeah, here in Malabon, especially, they use a lot of seafood because you're right next to the port. Mm -hmm. um, and anima sog, it is considered a more. You used to find this in like eateries, carnerias, and everything, and because it is crab, it's it's more expensive. Yeah. And so what is the sauce made of? It's usually like, depends where you get it, but it's usually, you know, oyster, soy. Really good. Mm. Bulaklak? Yeah. So you know what bulaklak means? No, we just Googled it. <laughs> no, no. But it means flour. It, oh, because it looks like a yeah. flour? So Filipino, especially when it comes to offal, they give it a romantic name so that you don't get... Thank you. Thank you. So you don't get grossed out by what it actually is. Right. So Adidas is chicken feet. Betamax, you know Betamax cassettes? Mm -hmm. That's the blood squares that they grill. Yeah. Uh, so they have these nicknames so that it feels a bit more palatable. <laughs> a beautiful, Are you a, fan? a beautiful intestine flour. I actually like it. It's yeah. this is what you could it's pulutan food, so it's really yeah. when you're drinking alcohol, this dipped in vinegar yeah. with a beer, you know. Can't go wrong. Yeah. It's finally going in the direction of like you love Thai food as well. Is it is it generally getting more accepted? Do people look for it more now as well? I definitely think that it is much more well known within um, like Americans. Mm. They know that. Like my husband would joke. He's like, before I met you, I didn't even know what a Filipino was, right? Like he didn't even know about the Philippines because. Where he grew up in Philly, there weren't a ton of Filipinos, Correct. or in the neighborhood that he grew up in. And so now people know, at least they know, like lumpia, adobo. So I'm really happy about that. I don't think it's where it should be. And I think that um, Andrew Zimmern and Anthony Bourdain, right, they both said many, many years ago, one of the next cuisines to look out for is Filipino food. Correct. And it hasn't quite gotten there yet. Yeah. And I think it's just, a, it's coming at a slower rate. But once it comes, it will take over yeah. and it will be really popular. Yeah. And it's really, it's it's nice to be a part of that in the States and it's nice to see 
all these, you know, thank all you. thank you, all these people that are trying, and especially on the West Coast, it's much more. I think it's more it's active. Having, yeah, it's yeah. more active than on the East Coast, um, but it's definitely happening. It's just not as fast. Yeah, but maybe I think sometimes slower growth is better, is better. than yeah. explosion, and then people are like, everyone tries to open a Filipino restaurant, they don't do it well, yeah. Yeah. and then people think Filipino food is not good. Correct. Yeah. I think a lot of times, I mean, in general, with Filipinos. Um, whether it's the food or the economy or uh, the, tur uh, the Philippines as a tourism destination, it's always been <clears throat> the next best thing. Yeah. Uh, the next big thing, sorry. And I always kind of wonder, I'm like, cool, it's, it's great to hear that every year. But I'm like, when does the next become, oh, it's a big thing. But yeah. you're right, it's a, it's a slow burn and hopefully it kind of gets accepted everywhere. And I think what you're doing kind of plays a part in that and what everyone else is kind of contributing towards yeah. that, right? I just think that it's important for you know my kids to know every aspect about where they came from right and I remember while I wasn't sure about Filipino food as a young kid I always loved coming to the Philippines I always look forward to it and it's something that I just want my kids to experience because it brought me so much joy yeah. and so the fact that you know my my two kids could spent three weeks with my mom in the Philippines in her country is to me it's beautiful it's yeah. amazing I know it would make my dad very very happy because he wished that he was Filipino yeah. like when I got my dual citizenship I was like oh my dad would be so jealous yeah. of me right yeah. now um, and I think it's just important to know where you come from and right. even if you're only a quarter Filipino it's still part of who you are right, right. it's yeah. I'm only half I grew up in America but it's still I feel connected to this country and I think that's really important. It's cool. It also just like being half, it made me feel legit. <laughs> you <laughs> You're like, I, mean? I have a passport. <laughs> Let me cook my food. I'm like, you guys can say whatever you want, but I am, I am Filipino. Filipino now. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs>